Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the November Argo CD and Rollouts community meeting. Uh, my name is Jesse Soon. I'm a contributor to uh, the Argo project uh, and mainly working on the Argo Rollouts uh, project these days. Um, so today we have uh, two demos and uh, or not one's a demo and one is a kind of a update and summary of, of the um, performance improvements that Alex has been working on in Argo CD. Um, the first one I'm really excited about, which is a new view in the Argo CD UI uh, to support um, uh, large applications, uh, meaning we, we have at Intuit, we have some apps that have um, hundred say pods and the current resource tree view is not really conductive of viewing um, what you're primary interested in for those type of, type of applications, which is uh, like a high level summary of, of um, what's going on and what nodes they're running on. Uh, so Remington has been working on, on this new view and he will be demoing uh, what that will look like. And it's still in development. So um, if you have your feedback and suggestions, then he's, I'm, uh, Remington will like love to hear it from you. Remington, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready whenever you guys are. Cool, Perfect. go ahead. Uh, you can start All sharing. Right. Cool, I'll go ahead and share my screen. All right, can you guys see it? Yeah. All right. Yes. Perfect. Um, so this is the new view. Uh, like Jesse said, it's still a work in progress. So if you guys have any feedback, I'd love to hear it. Um, but the main concept is that you have uh, all of your nodes uh, in this one view, and you can see pods that are associated with it. So to accomplish this, we had to expose some information about the nodes on the back end with uh, this endpoint here. Um, but yeah, so you can see you have um, a really quick way to see your uh, resources that have been used um, and how many you have available. You can see all the pods. Um, this is all generated. So this is a simulation um, because I couldn't run five nodes on Minikube. But um, yeah, so this is the new view. Um, what I'm hoping to accomplish as well is right now, uh, these pods are showing their health status rather than their actual pod phase. But I'm hoping to add a little switch somewhere um, where you can switch between viewing the pod phase and their health, um, the, the colors will change accordingly um, because most of these pods are running, um, but their health statuses are different. So um, yeah, any questions? What are the uh, what, STO and EF, EPH? Um, so STO is storage and EF, EPH is a thermal storage. So what I'm doing here is basically iterating over all of the items in the capacity and the allocatable fields for the, um, for the node status. And I'm abbreviating those keys uh, to three letters for space. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm hoping that I might, be, I might just add a label on the hover. So when you hover over this, maybe add a storage label so that it's more clear. Um, but yeah, I'm not really sure the best way to accomplish fitting that label in there. Okay, and maybe I think it's worth mentioning that we did plan to add additional way to group pods, not just by node, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, if you can talk about it. Yeah, uh -huh. so um, we're hoping to add, yeah, like Alex said, a way to group not just by node, by, uh, but by additional top level resources. And we're still discussing um, exactly how we're gonna do that. But um, yeah, there'll probably be some sort of drop down where you can configure that. Um, yeah, and the main use case is that imagine if you have an extremely uh, big tip application, big meaning a lot of pods, and let's say you are doing a rolling update, and if you choose a group uh, grouping by, let's say, replica set, you should be able to see how pods kind of floating from previous replica set to, to the next. Uh, yeah, and I guess that would be two different personas, like, uh, or yeah, using grouping by node view, you can see, for example, if your pods are well spread in production, like you don't want to see all production pods in one node. And then if you are uh, working on upgrading application, I think you're mostly interested in seeing 
how no, boards as part of the cost replica sets. Yeah. Definitely. Are are those just artifact errors where like there's ends up being spaces? Is yeah. Um, so yeah. So the reason for that is I believe these are being shown as missing. So like I said, this is a, a randomly generated simulation. And I think gotcha. that these pods are missing. Uh, the intention is for the missing pods to be uh, grayed out. But I think for whatever reason, the, the maybe the CSS selector is wrong and it's um, cool. it's just empty. Yeah. But it, yeah, those are just visual artifacts. Mm -hmm. awesome. um, oh, yeah. When... Can you... Go ahead. Actually. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Uh, can, you, can you actually drill down on the pod? You can. So um, the issue again is because it's a simulation, these pods don't actually exist. Um, um, but okay. when it's when it's actually running, if you click on it, it's the same thing as in the tree view. If you were to click on a pod, like um, let's find one. So if you were to click on this one, it would open the exact same panel. Um, awesome. But yeah, just because it's they're not they're not real. <laughs> and it looks really good. Thanks. Uh, yeah. When. Um comment i had uh, i had was uh, for others to know is that uh, this shows you for a per application so uh, these are only showing like there might be other stuff running on the node that are not displayed uh here um i'm wondering Ram, if if people may may be interested in in understanding um that there are stuff there but without without us but we would also not want to expose uh, the details of that. Uh, so in other words, if you're sharing nodes and um, you should be able to see all the pods of your application, which you can right now, um, but in case they are also wondering, um, like, am I over subscribed? Uh, we may need a way to show other pods unrelated to the application running on the nodes, but without being able to get to the details of that. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, something we can uh, think about and discuss. Definitely. Uh, and the, sorry, for the bar graphs on the left, the, or the, the, the bars, is that is for the node level or the, it's the app stats specically? And then how is that rolled up to an individual pod? Or is so it all that's, the pods? That's node level. So the, okay. the bars on the left are, are all node level, yep. Um, so this is just purely getting from, um, like I said, this is from the endpoint that we've added. So there's an informer um, that's looking at the actual like real time node stats. And that's what these are. And will it roll like if I have three worker nodes, is it going to roll the stats together that my pods um, are spread across or what's the plan? So if, are you saying if there's, if you have three different nodes or, so I'm trying to understand your question. Yeah, I guess if I, so if I deployed to a cluster and it's, a three node cluster will mm -hmm. the and the pot you know half the pods may end up on one and half the pods may up on the other depending on the affinity rules what are we mm -hmm. going to display for the bars will it be a combination of the both or will we split them or we don't so the bar i i believe that in that case there would be three different boxes for each node and okay. the bars would be per node so it would okay. be yeah so if you have three worker nodes then it's just stats for that node specifically and and the pods, yeah, they they're, they're just going to be shown as they lay, um, okay, as they actually are. Did I answer and your question? Actually, yeah, no, absolutely. Thank Perfect. you. And I think good point about your first question that these bars are showing kind of uh, CPU used by everything on that node, not just these pods. Because I don't think I don't believe we have data. We don't know how much CPU these pods exactly are using. So maybe JC like, and you you mentioned that. So basically, I think to make that uh, less ambiguous, we would have to show some kind of gray out pods which are not part of the same application. Right. Does, yeah, at, at least the, then, you know, CPU usage and all the pods which we are showing will kind of add up. Like it, it will make more sense. So what happens when you fill the square? Like if we had enough pods to get all the way to the top <laughs> uh -huh. um good that's question. a good question i'm thinking that it will probably just grow um so okay. there's a there's a way to make it so that it'll um it'll just grow the box um but i haven't completely fleshed that out yet so that's we a should, good consideration i think we should take inspiration from pods view. i think it opes view sorry there is a project i think yeah. 
Yeah. Few bucks for you. Mm -hmm. This is cool, Remington. A couple of thoughts. A couple of thoughts about it because you know I was feedback. It's quite colourful. Mm -hmm. And, and I, if I were colorblind, this wouldn't make any sense to me at all. Mm. Because, mm. because there's no iconography in the red squares to indicate that they're failed ones. So there should be some addition, you know, not just signal with color, but also signal with um, style or shape. Gotcha. Uh, well. Okay, yeah. I, I'd actually make the blue lines just black. Um, mm -hmm. Keep the other colors okay. as, as, as they are. And I'd use some kind of iconography to indicate the, the status of failed ones, probably. Not necessarily oh. um, the ones that are good could probably stay as green. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was considering that actually yesterday, um, thinking about the, like I said, the kind of dilemma between showing pod phase and the actual health status of the pods. Um, and I was thinking about how to handle that with some icon iconography, but um, yeah, that's, I was thinking about that for sure. Thanks, Alex. What, what's the algorithm for, for laying the pods out in the squares exactly? I, they're not grouped in any way by like, you know, yeah, um, so I, I struggled that, with that a bit. At first, I was trying to sort them by their status. Mm. Um, so basically sorting them by color. Mm. Uh, and I wasn't sure, I, I didn't land on a good way to do that or the, um, a logical way to do that. So right now it's just alphabetical. So based on their name. So these are just randomly generated names, but um, it's alphabetically sorted. Um, and then I figured that way, if you know the name of your pod, it's pretty easy to find it. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely open to feedback there if, if anybody has suggestions. Yeah, um, I did want to ask, and maybe this has already been asked, are the pods uh, group slash outlined in any way to like signify deployment or a stateful set or other sort of natural grooming, grouping? Um, so they are not in, in this simulation here, but what um, we were hoping to do is, like Alex said, kind of have the option to group by anything other than a node. So like a replica set or uh, deployment potentially. Um, so that'll probably just be a drop down um, somewhere up here with some other options that you'll get. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think there was two out of the box uh, groupings we were considering. Um, the first was top level resource. So um, <clears throat> if you have a, two deployments um, and uh, the pods were split between the two deployments, you would be able to group by the top level thing like deployment one and deployment two. And so um, uh, you would have some kind of division in this, in this interface where you can say, okay, I only care about the, um, uh, the pods. I wanna see all the pods for uh, uh, deployment one and deployment two uh, separately. The second grouping was actually by immediate parent resource. Um, so that would, uh, let's say you have a single deployment with a lot of pods in your middle of the update. Um, you have two replica sets uh, in, if you're in the middle of the update and you would like to see revision uh, two versus revision one of that same deployment. Um, that would, the media parent is a second grouping that we would provide as a um, grouping. So that way you can assess like, okay, revision two is not doing well, but revision one is. Um, I think there's, I think we also were open to other ideas of how to group um, things. That would, of course, mean that um, nodes would be duplicated because you can, if you're if you're grouping, say, by deployment and your yeah, pod split uh, uh, running on the same two deployments, um, uh, uh, then we would have to repeat the node in the in the two subdivisions. Um, I mean, that's, there's no, I don't think there's a way of getting around that. Yeah. And I, I guess the other reason why I was asking, because it also be interested, interesting to see via iconography or color or both the, the status of the parent resource. So say you had a staple set that had a pending update, all its pods would be green, but technically the staple set is in a pending status because it has some manual updates that you need to do, if that makes sense. Hmm. Um, yeah, that actually, that pending status is actually um, a, a status of the, the stateful set. So a pod doesn't know one way or another that it's, it shouldn't be there or. Yeah, I guess that's what I'm saying yeah. is being able to group by the stateful set, it'd also be interesting to see the status of the stateful set 
because this view wouldn't tell you that something was wrong um, necessarily. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I see what you're saying. Yeah, if we were to have that grouping or when we do have that grouping, we should definitely show, you know, oh, replica set one is, pro is still progressing or, um, or the SAFL set is still progressing. Uh, and then that would, yeah, that should be an obvious um, indicator in, in that uh, view. I mean, that could be your size drill down too. You could start at the deployments. And so if you, you know, you only have five of those, but if you click on one of those, then bubble up the pod data. So that if you, you know, if there were 150 pods total, but they're split amongst say 10 deployments that have, or that may have a replica set under it, you could have those kind of, you could have that roll up where again, you get that single picture versus, you know, looking at this extended map of green with maybe a one red in it or something like that for 150 yeah. pods. Anyways, mm -hmm. I just um, I'm going to take a screenshot. I'm going to share it with you guys just to reiterate my point about the colors here. Uh, I just need to open it up. So this is using an app called Sim Daltonism, which basically um, puts a window of your desktop. To... Are you, do you want to share, Alex? I'm trying to share. I'm just struggling to get it to click on the actual window that I want to share. Ah, right, hang on. It's because there is no window. Let yeah. me try. Uh, let me just, I'm going to reshare that. I had a little user error because I had a window open showing uh, color. This is a colorblind view of, of, of the, the application. Oh, can you see that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can see that actually the yellow is, isn't too bad. Um, but you can see that the reds and the greens are pretty much indistinguishable to somebody who's colorblind. Mm -hmm. um, this is deutranopia. Um, yeah. But it, it simulates, it's called sim daltonism. It, sim it simulates a number of different ones. Yeah. Um, would that be something, because I imagine this is not the only place in this UI or any of Argo's UIs that has this issue. Is this maybe something in the Argo UI repository? Mm -hmm maybe add some support for specifying a color scheme. That way, like we could quote unquote, get um, colorblind support for free for all of our Go apps for these sort of statuses. And a user could specify a uh, red, blue, green or other things. Cause I know that's what how, that's how some um, games and other applications mm -hmm. would tackle this issue. Yeah, there's probably accessibility libraries we you could look at bringing in that would give us that. You, you, I mean, you could, I mean, so obviously with everything, it's easier to have something, you know, anything that's accessible by default is easy to use for anybody. Yeah. Um, you know, same goes for things like, you know, steps outside your house. You know, as soon as you put a handrail in for your steps, you're going to be able to get up your steps easier as, as, as well. You know, a tap is easy to turn for an able, able, you know, for a disabled person, but also easy to turn for, for a disabled person. As this is obviously the Argo, um, uh, workflows interface. You can see this workflow here is just you know it's lost all its you know it's lost all its color here. But you can see because it's got a tick on it, and you can you can tell that it's, it's things. And actually, it's, it's not necessarily a problem for people with other, other types of color blindness. Yeah, for this yeah. one, you don't you don't have an issue. I will now stop sharing. Oh, I, I, have I, a, I have to do quick, that. Yeah, I have a quick question on the original presentation that was there. Do you mind sharing the screen again? Yeah, not um, at all. Uh, thank you. Let's see here. Uh, so my question would be, um, I think the, the metrics that we are showing there, they're on a node basis, but not on the Argo applications pods basis. Um, is there, like, is there a con conscious design decision or is it more because there might be technical challenges with getting them for the specific pods for the app application in current context? Actually, it is uh, only showing you um, the pods related to your application. So the idea is that we filter on pods that are only associated with your application. Right, but the is that the same for the metrics as well? Because I think I heard something different. The CPU oh, memory. Um, oh, for the metrics, so like CPU usage. Um, I'm 100% sure it's not, I mean, we don't have that data now. I think it's kind of, a tech, it's like challenging to get it. Because um, we, all we have is we have kind of output of kubectl get pods and we can filter it. Plus we have kubectl get nodes. I don't think you have enough data on pod to figure out how much CPU it uses kind of. Uh, so all of this is requests, is it not? 
<laughs> there happens to be a metrics API, I think, mm-hmm. which the kubelet emits per pod. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't have the precise details, but in OpenShift, we have a concept of user workload monitoring where you potentially can, in a per namespace basis, get CPU memory for the pods that are running in there. Um, I mean, if if it's a technical challenge, then we could probably discuss further and see if we can solve it. No, because I think, to me, it would be extremely useful if I could see the metrics for um, the pods I care I care about. Um, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, to it would be useful at a pod at a node level as well. But then I do wonder that if I see my CPU and memory is hitting the roof, um, and my application is not responsible for that. Um, I would kind of feel a bit awkward there that it's something else that's causing that, but I'm seeing that in the context of my Argo application. What do I do about it? Um, so that's, that's, that's what I was wondering that, is, is it worth exploring a way to overcome that technical challenge? And if yes, uh, should we do it? Yeah, I mean, I think both are, are useful because on the flip side, it's good to know that the node is totally overutilized yeah. and I want to move it. But the, yeah, no, if I'm only responsible for 10%, it allows me to choose where I might go as well. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think both are useful there. <laughs> if, if I may play devil's advocate here for a little bit. So it, yeah. like based on the discussion and the excitement, it sounds like a lot of people have interest in this type of view. Are there any opinions against this type of view? And I only bring that up because Argo CD is a GitOps tool and this is more of a monitoring solution. And like the monitoring space for Kubernetes is already quite saturated. So is anyone against moving more monitoring tools into Argo CD? I would rather argue that, you know, if we could plug into those existing monitoring tools and show a view on top of it in the native Argo, um, user experience that would be valuable. Um, but then yes, um, as long as, as we can plug into the existing ecosystem and be opinionated about it, that's fine. That would be good. Yeah. And I feel like there was some, we had discussions about that. And I guess so far the thinking was that because we already have data, uh, and we don't have to, you know, introduce a new service like the database to get to show something. Then we kind of we're willing to build UI to, to show what we already have, and this is totally based on already collected data. So it was kind of mostly UI. Uh, yes, and I feel like if we try to uh, resolve the second problem um, that Shobek mentioned, you know, if we if we once we try to show CPU only for pods. And if we find that we have to start, I don't know, if we have to really make Argo CD heavier, then maybe it could, it could be, yes, and then it could be an argument against it. So we could say like, uh, not worth it, but if it's still possible to keep Argo CD light and- uh, Yeah, get the data, I would say yeah. that's, it's kind of like a fine line. Um, and where I, in my mind, where I would draw the line is, um, exactly where Alex says, if we start having to get in the business of implementing like metric specific, um, the, you know, functionality, then that's kind of step overstepping. But since all of this stuff is actually uh, um, gleaned from Kubernetes API, um, that it seems like a cheap win. Um, Why not present um, the information that we have in uh, more useful ways? Yeah, and uh, to toss in my two cents there, at least personally for me, the pod view is much more interesting than the metric view since I do have Prometheus set up for that. I have Instana set up for that. I imagine most companies have their own APM. So the if all things considered, the pod view is what I'm really attracted to here. The, um, the, the stats view, I actually will agree, is kind of pointless for, for our use case because of the fact that it doesn't um, narrow that down to what percentage of that usage is actually coming from the pods that are being outlined by that application. So I'd sort of agree. Wait, oh, which actually I do think we could break that down if we're only solely going on requests. Um, like the math should all add up uh, in terms of um, we we have the pod object, we know how many re- what what it's requesting, and we have the node object, and we know its capacity. Um, 
you know, clicking on one pod should be able to outline on the left side, like how much of that or clicking on all of the pods should outline. Um, so I, I think it's doable. It's just how far we want to take it. Yeah, and, and, and to quickly add to that, um, Jesse Remington, I was just wondering, um, and I'm sorry if I missed that conversation a while back, um, do, we, do we have an interest in grouping the, these pods? Because I'm wondering, if I see 10 yellow pods and those 10 yellow pods belong to 10 different deployments who, where each of them have five more pods already. So it's less of a concern for me compared to those 10 yellow pods are all belonging to one deployment and that's a serious issue. So um, if we could figure out, and, and, and I know in this you know, real estate, it's gonna be really hard there. If you could figure out how to group them and say, hey, you have 10 deployments and there's one yellow in all of them, that's not a big of a deal. Um, uh, yeah, we actually just dis, uh, discussed that. We, the two groupings that we were gonna have, one is actually at the top level resource. So associate all the pods its top level resources. And then the second grouping um, was by its immediate parent. So the replica got set it. Got it, got it, yeah. Totally makes sense, thank you. And I think it's one of the most important use cases for that, uh, like at least we have users who actually, they use RGCD as a replacement for kubectl uh, for troubleshooting and they missing that ability to, you know, uh, figure out what's happening with the application and they need to see this grouping by either replica set or by deployment. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you. All right, uh, thanks Remington. This is looking really good. Thanks, thanks guys. I appreciate it. Good work, thank you. Thank you. We've, right, got some UI work on, uh, we've got some UI work on Argo workflows if you want to do some more. <laughs> well, maybe in January, we'll see. <laughs> Thanks All right. For that sounds... uh, I'm going to start my share. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Okay, so next, um, Alex has been doing a lot of work on improving performance of Argo CD. Um, he'll, start, he'll talk about some of the things coming up in 1.8 that, um, that hugely if, uh, improves the performance. Uh, let me start sharing my screen. Okay, hopefully you can see it. So, um, all right, so uh, I'm Alex, I'm a software engineer on Argo CD and uh, last uh, Argo CD milestone, I spent most of my time working on Argo CD uh, improvements and these improvements are going to be available in next release in 1.8. And I prepared an extremely like, short presentation which kind of explains what we did. And it was not, was not just me, it's a team worked on these improvements. Um, okay, uh, let me start from the first one. So <clears throat> it's related to Argo CD application controller. And that slide kind of briefly explains uh, some of the things which we did with it. And before I go into details, I want to just uh, explain the problem. Um, uh, so Argo CD has three components. Our uh, controller is one of them. And controller is responsible for Argo CD application reconciliations. And controller needs to know kind of what's happening in, a cluster, in connected clusters. And then it compared uh, live clustered information with the data provided by another component, Argo CD repo server, which provides um, expected manifests extracted from Git. So basically, to recap, controller is supposed to uh, get data from the cluster and compare it with uh, expected manifests and it requires CPU and memory. And the problem is that right now, uh, at least as of 1.7 release, it's impossible to scale up controller. You can have only one replica. And basically if you keep adding clusters, you have to keep adding memory and CPU to controller pod. Uh, and basically in, in 1.8 release, we finally improved it. So now it is possible to have uh, several replicas of application controller. And this is how uh, we did it. So that picture tries to explain uh, what is going to happen if you scale up application controller. Um, so application controller might have now several replicas 
and each replica is going to be available for a shard. And uh, what is a shard? A shard is just a set of clusters and related applications. So basically each shard will only care about subset of connected clusters and applications that are deploying into that cluster. And this little formula explains how shard is calculated. So um, we considered multiple ways how to uh, can, you know, calculate the shard and we decided to just go ahead and choose a random sharding kind of. It's going to just use a UID of a cluster and uh, mod uh, divided by uh, available replicas. So uh, yeah, if you scale up controller, it will kind of auto divide clusters between each replica. And then uh, each replica will take care of only subset of controllers or applications and clusters. And feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. And I had another slide about it. It kind of explains how to enable that feature. So um, controller was converted from deployment to stateful set. And this is a, a strategic mesh patch, which you can apply in, let's say, uh, customize to enable um, uh, to start scaling up controller, you need to change number of replicas of a stateful set, and you need to set this environment variable manually. And it kind of, it, it is good and bad. So uh, the good thing is that, so the bad thing is that you have to duplicate it, but the side effect is positive that every time you add a new replica, you need to kind of re, uh, rebalance all the uh, clusters and applications across new replicas. So by changing that value in the pod template, you trigger kind of re restart of and redeployment of, of uh, stateful set pods. So every, let's say tomorrow, if you upgrade to 1.8 and then you decide to scale up, what will happen is you will uh, increase number of replicas and update a uh, template of each replica which will trigger a rolling update and you know your, your previous version of your controller, which take care of every clusters and all the applications, it will need to be deleted. And instead of it, you will get two new replicas and each one will, uh, will be responsible for reconciling only half of cl uh, clusters and applications. Okay, uh, any questions so far? Does it all make sense? I want to hear yes from at least one person to make sure <laughs> you could hear me. <laughs> I <laughs> have a Alex question. <laughs> uh, so Alex had a question about um, mm -hmm. the sharding algorithm. He said, uh, I think Alex, you're asking, uh, did we consider using ownership of the controller ref ownership yeah. as a sharding mechanism? Yes. So I mean, we have the same problem in workflows mm -hmm. that we only run a single monolithic controller. And so that guy can be killed at any point by the, you know, the, the Kubernetes manage, uh, manager. And as, as a result, it, there has to bootstrap itself and that can take, you know, a significant amount of time during which you've got no service. And we were hoping to solve that kind of um, DR situation and HA as well. Originally we looked at having a hot standby controller, but it would still be a very large one. And then we looked a bit at controller ref and I just didn't know how this related to controller ref. Uh it, that was considered. So I'm just going to answer to like mm -hmm. the first question. If we consider to use ownership. Uh, so it was considered, but I think we kind of decided to just, uh, so that the door is still open. And I think we want to, we decided to move kind of slowly and then deliver the most kind of simple, but the most robust way to scale up, scale down controller mm -hmm. uh, to basically shard controller. And then code is written in a way so it is still possible to use ownership reference. And I think the problem is that control, we kind of, the complication is that you do not want to start and restart controller very frequently. And the reason is because uh, it just takes time and it kind of every time controller starts, it fires a lot of uh, Kubernetes API requests. So every controller restart is kind of costly. Uh, plus it's, you know, downtime. So it felt like 
it is too it was uh, okay frankly saying it was too difficult to go ahead and implement the most complex solution so we decided to implement the simplest possible one and make sure it's stable and people can use it and then as a next step we can make it kind of so pretty much right now this logic to choose the right number of replicas is on the user right now. And then next step, we can try to automate it and use, uh, you know, make controller smarter and then controller can uh, use uh, ownership to kind of claim clusters and, yeah, and provide better sharding, automated sharding. Yeah, when, one of the key subtle differences, I think between the work flow problem in the Argo CD problem is that um, the application controller is dealing with applications, the workflow controller is dealing with workflows. Mm -hmm. And while the workflow can shard on workflows, the application controller needs to mm -hmm. shard on clusters because clusters are the performance um, optimization, the thing that we need to optimize on because we can't have multiple shards all both looking at the same cluster. We need the cluster to be ah, the unit of the um, of course, you're right. That's so a difference, yeah. Mm -hmm. And okay, and there is one other thing which I it's not on that slide, but uh, it is possible to pin a cluster to shard. Uh, so there is a new field in uh, supported in secret which represents cluster. So you can add a shard field into the data of uh, the secret, and then controller will kind of no matter what will decide that. It's shard number one. It's like replica number one, for example, responsible for that uh, cluster. So what that allows you to do is that imagine if you have 100 uh, clusters, um, like 100 mid-sized cluster and one giant cluster, which is like extremely heavy. So in this case, you can have let's say four replicas to handle 100 clusters and fifth replica. Uh, which is dedicated just for extremely big and heavy cluster. In this case, you can uh, specify a number five here in number of replicas, mm -hmm. and then four in Argo CD controller replicas environment variable. So what that means is uh, four replicas are going to handle 100 clusters, and the fifth replica is not going to handle any uh, cluster except the big one, which is supposed to have pinned chart, like uh, explicitly specified chart uh, to number five. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, that, so it's like a little trick which allows you to handle edge cases. And the idea of uh, doing that was that the same uh, kind of way to manipulate with shards can be used later on if we have automated self -shard sharding and maybe in future releases if it's needed. So there is basically what I was trying to say uh, in documentation, you will find more details about it, but there is a way to handle edge cases where you have clusters which are kind of outstanding from other clusters. And then in future, we still have kind of doors open to make this, uh, to implement some smart logic which does it for you. Um, speaking of smart logic, um, maybe uh, a silly question is there a reason you have to specify environmental variable versus Argo just mm -hmm. yes. reading it, that value itself? Uh, yeah, this is kind of our, the cheap way to um, make sure that every replica is only handling uh, right clusters and you do not have kind of two replicas which are trying to handle the same set of clusters. So if tomorrow you need to increase number of replicas and you let's say you change this number from two to three, or like to four, uh, that means existing uh, replicas have to be restarted, or at least the existing replicas needs to, you know, uh, start uh, handling different set of clusters. And right now, only way would be to kind of kill these replicas and create new ones. And this and these new ones are supposed to know how they should rebalance uh, clusters. So. So I understand that you change the environment variable to force the container to restart. And at the uh, same time, yeah. And plus, basically, this value is going to be used by uh, each replica to figure out which clusters it's now responsible for. 
that's used as the modulo of yes, the yes exactly so wow. that's part so, of the problem is a, it's actually a classic kubernetes problem is that there's no downward api for the replica count oh okay if they had that this would actually not be necessary uh, yeah, if I, credit, we would have to still react on yeah still, we would like, but the yeah. controller could monitor and say oh the replicas um changed and i i, I should restart myself i mean Mm -hmm. uh, but it would have been a e slightly easier configuration uh, burden. Yeah, I guess that that was ultimately the question is why not do that? But I oh, guess yeah. uh, that's the answer is simplicity. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, still, I, I think this opened up the problem that uh, people can make mistakes. So what is the consequence of that? So the replicas will be set to be four, but mm -hmm. the, the environment variable is just two. So what will happen? In this case, uh, you will not be like half of your clusters would not be even handled. Basically, you would not uh, get any updates. Like if you click a uh, refresh button on an application that belongs to cluster which shard is like four, uh, you would see nothing. It would not be reconciled. Oh, I'm talking about the reversed way. I, I know. Okay, that direction is a half of the cluster will not be moving oh, yeah. at oh, all. If, if it's reversed, then you have controllers which are fighting and they kind of trying to reconcile the same thing. Again, hey, again. Right. Okay. Is this? Would do you, actually? Can we use a um, environment value from field ref that reference? I was about to say that. Yes, <laughs> that should work, right? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. We, we could, yes, we the can. field increase. path, right? Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure field ref lets you specify arbitrary paths of. It does not. It has, I actually literally just looked it up. There's a very limited set of fields you can pull. Oh, okay. Yeah, I feel like it's just like metadata labels and annotations and names. I, I thought spec.replicas should be available, but you're saying it's not. That's interesting. It is not. Yeah, okay. especially since uh, the downward API works on the pod level, not on the higher level abstraction. So the downward API has no way of going all the way up to the deployment and get our staple set in this case and get oh, those replicas. Got it. But I, I but see the problem. I feel like it's a good, we can at least try and make you know our best to explain it in documentation. And even in the YAML, which represents staple set, we or in, in this so we provide an, the same example in documentation. Maybe we can use, for example, uh, YAML, I think it's called anchor feature where you kind of specify value once and then oh, so okay. in this case it, it just it's still going to be on totally on client side but at least you know less chances of making mistake although so, i don't think you can convert that into a string i don't know yeah I need to. <laughs> uh, yeah I, I i i think it's good enough uh, so put a strong documentation there because when i think about it it's more like the cassandra and also the gossip it's more like the discovery problem but maybe we don't need to spend that huge amount of effort to make the work for now. Just so we can move on to by the looking code. looking forward. Yeah. I mean, uh, so the application controller it, it knows about basically the the cluster it's running in, right? So and the pod will have an owner reference to the stateful set, and maybe we could work up this way to get the number of replicas. Yeah, I think this is, it's again, it's like, I'm, <clears throat> I thought about it and I, I also, I kind of, I keep, I wanted to do it as a second step. And I think there is a smooth transition. We can introduce a kind of configuration, another environment variable. And instead of providing number here, let's say we can give a magic keyword, self-manage it. And then controller should expect it has permissions to mm -hmm. talk to a stateful set and then exactly implement the same logic. So it, it kind of every, sometime it checks for number of replicas in parent stateful set. And if it detects the difference, it just restarts and, you know. Uh, and another way I think is since the Redis is already the must have component. So there is a way we can use the Redis to, to broadcast the identity yeah. and, uh, and, and rebalance if needed. Now we're repeating the same conversation we had with Jan about it. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. No, no, this is good. I understand. It's right. Same. Okay, I I want to move on because there was there were two other enhancements I wanted to uh, talk about, and we have only ten minutes left. So this has, by the way, this has been used in our production environment, and we're successfully scaling it to two hundred and eighty clusters right now on a single Argo CD instance. 
Yeah, that did help. Um, okay, and uh, the next enhancement is related to an um, Argo CD repo server. So again, I want to kind of describe the problem. So repo server is a component uh, and it, it's responsible to clone your uh, Git repository and then produce manifests. And it has integration with config management tools like Helm Customize. So it works well if your applications are distributed across many uh, rep repository uh, sorry, many Git repositories. And as long as you have like four or five applications per repo, there is no problem. But if you have a mono repo, so one Git repository which has hundreds of applications, then uh, there is a performance uh, issue. Uh, and the problem is, um, uh, repo server one instance of re each repo server is able right now is able to execute one uh, manifest generation request per repository at the same time so this graph kind of illustrates you the problem if you have uh, here is uh, the example uh, applications repository so if you go ahead right now and create four applications pointing to the same git repository and then try to ref refresh all four applications this is what's going to happen. So repo server is just going to sequentially process them. So it will process application one first and then uh, so then the next one and so on. So, and this is basically, it's not good. Uh, I know that some users have to scale uh, repo server a lot to overcome the problem. Uh, and we, we just made some improvements. So the next slide explains what we did. So we considered several ways to improve it. One was to simply clone repository more than once or potentially clone it, use kind of separate clone for each request. Uh, but then we've, I kind of stopped and I checked the like use case. And I feel like the most important use case is that uh, mono repository. And typically here's what happens. Um, so if you have one mono repository, uh, and then you kind of connect all the applications. Uh, then eventually all applications manifests are generated for each application and they are in cache and, and then everything is working. And then as soon as you commit one, uh, make one change in the repository, then immediately cache is kind of have to invalidate it for all applications because new commit potentially introduce new changes and we need to go ahead and recalculate uh, regenerate manifest for all applications. And then at this point of time, controller sends a uh, couple requests for each application. So at the same time, you get a bunch of queries to repo server. And then, and this is what causes slowness is because uh, basically pretty much for the, like for, for the most of the time, repo server does nothing and then it get bunch of requests, which it can only process sequentially. And this is the real problem. So what we did is that uh, instead of trying to clone things multiple times, I kind of, I'm taking advantage of this uh, batch processing, which happens uh, naturally because controller needs to get new manifests for all applications at the same time. And so what happens right now is that repo server, it will get bunch of concurrent requests and then it will try to get group all the requests which belongs to the same revision. And it's safe to process um, all requests for the same revision for the same repo in parallel, because uh, you just need to kind of move your repository uh, and check out uh, into the expected state, in, I mean, check out their expected revision, and then just run a customized build or Helm template for all of them at the same time. And you just need to make sure your uh, repo server has enough CPU and memory to handle 10 or like 100 kubectl uh, sorry, customized builds. And then it moves to the next uh, revision. So, and that's hopefully solved the problem. So, and we, um, in addition to that, there is additional kind of Im improvement is that uh, in previous version for each request, we have to run uh, git fetch to make sure we get the latest uh, changes. And if you use Helm, we need to download dependencies. Uh, with the new design, we have to do that uh, repo initialization process only once for, 
for batch uh, of requests. Yeah, and this is a testing results. So we try to do it, uh, we try to test it on just internal uh, Argo CD. So we have uh, one uh, Argo CD that manages a lot of applications, but basically there is one repo which has 40 Argo CD applications and with just two repo server instances, I try to kind of do the following test. Uh, I have wrote a script that refreshes all 40 applications twice. First time uh, it kind of uses the cached version of manifests. And second time it supply a flag that force cache refresh. So that means basically you have two requests uh, to you request a refresh of, of the same set of applications twice. And first time using cached manifests and second time you regenerate manifests. So the difference is that how much time it took to generate manifests. And this is the results. So before implementing this improvement, it would take 15 seconds to <clears throat> generate manifests for 40 applications. And after it just took one second. So it is a huge improvement if you, if you have mono repo with a bunch of applications. Yeah, and I'm, I, I know that before we release this version, I'm hoping to work with uh, Argo, you know, use, uh, more users of Argo CD who have the same problem and do the same test and see if we're missing something. And in Argo CD, in documentation, there are some gotchas about it. Like in some cases, we still have to process um, requests in parallel, but there are workarounds. So in documentation, you will find more information about it. And if you, you know, are willing to help with testing, please let me know. <laughs> we'll be happy to uh, try this uh, pre-release version with you. Oh, this is amazing. Wow, this number increase, decrease is amazing. Great job. I think it uh, might be possible to try out the 1.8 repo server with a 1.7 uh, Argo CD. Is that um, no, I, I, it's like there, there were other changes. Which oh, right, 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 OK. Yeah. Right. So some breaking changes of you know internal API has changed. Okay. Um, Never mind. Yeah, I had the same thought, but I know it's it's impossible right now. Okay, and uh, oh, okay. Yeah, I forgot to tell you about uh, it's kind of continuation of the same work. So as you remember, I, I described that use case where you have a mono repo. And then you commit one change, and then you kind of invalidate change, uh, manifests for all applications in that repository. But at the same time, sometimes you just know that your application depends only certain folders in that repository. And we wanted to take advantage uh, of it. It was actually contributed externally, most of the code. So um, in 1.8 version, you can leverage a webhook to kind of reuse cache from previous commits. And this is the idea. So it is possible right now to um, annotate Argo CD application. And then the annotation explains to Argo CD which folders from your repo actually are important for manifest generation. So in this case, it's like a dot, which means, you know, just a current working directory. So not current work, uh, the directory, which is target directory of application. You can say uh, dot dot slash shared customized base, or you can list comma separate. You have you can have comma separated list of passes here within your repo. And what happens is that if you have this annotation, and if you configure a Git webhook, Argo CD will check webhook payload, and it will from payload it will figure out previous commit, the new commit and all the changes between these two commits. And if uh, none of changes from between these two commits affect manifest generation based on that annotation, then Argo CD will just copy manifests cached for previous commit into the cache for the new, uh, for the new commit. So yeah, and basically in this case, you, like if you modify and create me .md file, Argo CD applications are not going to be reconciled and, the, and then uh, repo server won't have to generate cache again because we know that uh, uh, readme.md file changes basically don't change uh, manifest at all. 
Okay. Any does it make sense? Any questions about that improvement? So the dot is a relative path to the spec source path, right? Yes. Yes. So and you you have options here. You can just say you can give a, an absolute path. An absolute path means absolute path within the repository. Oh. Okay. Or you can say, uh, you know, if you use dot, that then it's relative to the application path. Okay. Yes, and cool. I think the most kind of common use case is that if you have a lot of applications, and then you know that your manifest generation depends on uh, content of target path, plus you know that all your applications share the same uh, Customized base, for example, and then you know absolute path of that customized base. In this case, you would say dot colon slash customized base. Okay. I we're at the question. very end here, but I did have one last question. I hope I can squeeze in, mm -hmm. which is it sounds like you're effectively doing this, but has there been consideration for completely breaking out the responsibility of pulling Git repositories and then generating the manifest into two separate? Um, controllers are two separate, separate scalable units of work rather than having them be one sort of big thing. Uh, kind of like what Flux is doing with their V2. Oh, you think we kind of, we would have a separate worker for each repository? Is it uh, the case? Uh, so Flux has specific controllers, like a customized controller, or I think um, mm -hmm. like a Helm, I think there's another Helm one. Um, so that controller is solely responsible for rendering YAML from using a specific tool. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the question is around currently repo server is responsible for both the Git operations and the tooling uh, rendering of the mm -hmm. YAML. Um, would we consider splitting that those responsibilities? I can um, transfer it right now. Yeah, I think it's I, it might make sense. So I think we should just we should think about it more. I see how it can be kind of difficult to do because um... I, I feel like there. Uh, I mean, this, this is my quick take on it: is that um, the the I feel like you need the the um, repo to do the tooling operation. I, I don't know how they were able to split that. Uh, yeah. How, how they do it with Flux is the source controller pulls the source, packages it in like an S3 API, and then other controllers read that S3 API to pull the repo files and then perform the tooling operations. Oh, so, okay. So, oh, they they through, kind of, so it's actually a file transfer? Yeah, there is actually a file transfer. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and in theory, y'all could use Flux's source controller if you so wanted, because it's designed to be a generic sort of pull tool. Yeah. And just to kind of clarify, uh, so in uh, let's say there was magic way to kind of run an ephemeral container and then kill it, uh, that would solve the problem. Like uh, you, you facing. So if if like if user could specify a manifest generator and that generator is kind of container, it takes input and then. Yeah, I wasn't actually even thinking that far, mm. like. Repo server could still be sort of like the collection of tools it has now, but that would also be cool too, because I know one thing we're doing today to use a cool tool called CDK8 to generate manifests is we're currently, in, we're building our own image by stacking Node.js and CDK8 on top of that. Mm -hmm. So it'd be cool if we didn't have to do that where there's the repo server and then we have our own image which actually handles tooling. Okay, yeah. That, um... And all right, and it's not really answer to your question, but we have this painting item to improve custom integration with uh, other tools, like all kinds of tools for manifest generation. So what we have right now is kind of a bare minimum, but the goal eventually is to improve it so that any connected kind of custom plugin provide the same level of uh, you know, user experience as Helm or Customize, for example, but we just didn't get there yet. But at least it's one of the things which we want to work on, for sure. Absolutely. Cool. OK, we already run out, out of time. And I, I just I did, I did wanted to mention this last improvement is that we in this UI, uh, release, we worked on UI improvements as well. So in as part of 
we cherry picked a lot of API uh, review server uh, fixes back to 1.7. So API already kind of quicker. If you use 1.7, you can see that it's more responsive. But what was missing is this last bit where sometimes uh, if you have a lot of applications, then application updates getting slower and UI was not kind of ready for that. Uh, so UI was kind of not very responsive. If you click synchronize, for example, then nothing happens. It's kind of just, you know, actually synchronize is a bad example. This is the one we fixed already, but other buttons like that in 1.7 release. So if you make a change in application details and then click save, there is no visual indication that something is happening. So, and that was fixed in, in 1.8 release. So UI is now more responsive. Yeah, and I think this may be it. It's the most obvious improvement. So no, should be no questions about that. All right, this is I, it. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we ran over time. There was one question. I'm not sure. Uh, I lost the person who asked it, um, but they were asking about if the rollouts had integrated Slack notifications. Um, so the answer to that is uh, it does not currently, um, but there is an issue about a generic notification mechanism that we're thinking about. And then actually the scope of that um, increased to now we're actually trying to think of how can we achieve a notification, um, uh, I guess, consistency across the project. Because right now the Argo CD has this notification system. Rollouts is currently thinking of how to do notification. And then workflow is also, um, uh, has a little bit of a um, need to do that. And so right now, one of the things we're thinking about is actually how can we consolidate on a standard configuration that all of the different projects uh, could reuse. Um, I think by next community meeting, we might have a proposal um, ready. So also ping me if you're interested in, um, in being involved. All right, I think we, thanks for sticking around a little longer uh, than normal. Uh, I think we had some good discussions. So thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks guys. Thank you.